This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Yes, the show that'll have you saying afterwards, wow, I learned something new today. At least that's our goal. Anywho, welcome to another Farm Monitor. Ray D'Alessio flying solo with you this week. Kenny B on assignment. Straight ahead, how awesome is this? The Georgia National Fair up and running again after a year off due to COVID. We'll share some of the sights and sounds and tell you the impact it has on the local economy. Also in the program, a story 50 years in the making. Acres and acres of muscadines and the Georgia winemaker who overcame a number of challenges this year. Plus, well, hey everybody, Ranger Nick here, coming up a little bit later. You know, education has sure changed a lot in these COVID times, but I'm gonna introduce you to one educator that's getting kids outside, sampling the water and streams and seeing what kind of wildlife they can find. That and a whole lot more starts right now on the Farm Line. And we begin in Perry, where the 32nd annual Georgia National Fair is slowly winding down. And let's just say it's been nothing short of a major success. Of course, the annual part, well, that streak broken last year due to COVID. But hey, what's done is done. And as Damon Jones explains, a return to normalcy while still taking the necessary precautions was a welcome treat for all those in attendance. The rides, the shows, and of course, the food made the return to the Perry National Fairgrounds after taking a year hiatus due to the pandemic. And it was better than ever as this year's fair provided plenty of entertainment to each person making their way through the gates, no matter their age or preference. We're so excited to have the fair this year. The community, all of our team members missed the, um, the atmosphere that the fair brings, all the new faces the fair brings. So to have it happening right now uh, is so exciting for all of us. So we have the funnel cake, over 75 rides, turkey on a leg, uh, livestock shows. We have um, entertainment magicians, 11 free concerts this year. So there's definitely something for everyone. And it's not a moment too soon as this week long event has a lasting impression on not just the fairgrounds, but the surrounding communities as well. It's the kind of economic booster that was sorely missed after last year's event was postponed. The economic footprint of the Georgia National Fair to our community and our state is enormous. Um, just between 2012 and 2019, the sales tax revenue that was generated from our rides and our vendors on site has been over $5 million. That doesn't include the sales tax dollars and the East Blast dollars that are brought in by people shopping in downtown Perry or stopping at gas stations in Houston County. The return of the fair also meant the return of the Junior National Livestock Show as hundreds of Georgia 4-H and FFA students, along with their families, made the trek out to the fairgrounds in order to show off all the hard work that was put in over the past year caring for their animals. So that's probably one of the best things that I think happens um, here at the fairgrounds as far as everybody showing. And I'm really excited to be able to show. Um, it's my first year showing big cattle this year and I've showed the hogs for the past seven years. And so um, I'm really excited to be able to do this. Um, we put in a lot of work at home as a family, so to be able to come out here and share it um, in our wins and even in our loses, um, it's pretty fun. I enjoy it a lot. Um, we are so excited that we got here this year. We have worked so hard for the past year to be ready for this weekend, and we are just happy that everyone could come out and see us. Well, we spend hours every night at the barn taking care of these animals, and we just want to show everybody what we have done, and we are so excited to see what everybody else has got and show everybody what we've got. While there are plenty of prizes, not to mention bragging rights to be had at this event, it's not really the competition that these students enjoy the most. It's actually the opportunity to spend quality time with friends and family who share the same interest in showing livestock. So what I enjoy most about coming out here is like this ambassador program, getting to be with all my friends. Um, we all share the same passion, so I mean, it's fun for all of us to come out here, exhibit our animals, be together spend the whole week together. So. Um, I enjoy being with my family and friends and we are all passionate about the same thing. We are passionate about showing our livestock and getting to come out here and show everybody that is just so exciting to us. Reporting from Houston County, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. In the meantime, in a report from American Farm Bureau, trade data shows 2021 U.S. exports 
are up with a significant increase in exports to China. Senior economist Veronica Nye says cumulative exports to China needs to be about $20 billion, and to date that number is roughly $18 million, only 12 percent behind where they need to be in order to reach the 2021 total value. Nye says as a whole, U.S. exports are strong despite transportation challenges. On the West Coast, we have port congestion. In the Gulf, they're still recovering from Hurricane Ida. So, so far, 2021, the U.S. has exported over $115 billion in U.S. agricultural exports, of which almost 16 percent of that has been going to China. U.S. ag exports are up 28 percent compared to the same time period in 2020. Exports to China are up almost 120 percent. Meantime, cotton, peanuts, pecans, all staples of Georgia agriculture, correct? Ah, but lest we forget those precious and highly coveted muscadines. An acquired taste for some, I know. But in Irwin County, there's a family operation turning heads with their muscadines. John Holcomb headed south to see for himself and to maybe, just maybe, sample some of the goods for research purposes. Vines as far as the eye can see and sweet muscadines. That's what you'll get here in Irwin County at Polk Vineyards, a family-run operation that was started decades ago when this man, Jacob Polk, decided to take a leap of faith and plant muscadines on his farm. Fifty years ago, my late grandfather Jacob Polk planted what was his first, what were his first muscadine vines, and so he took uh, five acres on his fourth-generation family farm and planted muscadines. And today, roughly 50 years later, we grow over 600 acres of muscadines. Muscadines, because they're a native grape, a native fruit, they've, they've thrived and they grow really well here in Georgia, this hot, humid climate. Just because they're native, though, doesn't mean that growing them doesn't come without any challenges. Thanks to the weather this year, this season has been a difficult one for them. Muscadines are a native American grape, and they do, while they do thrive here in the, in the deep south, there are challenges, like with any crop, and so, of course, we're not in control of the weather, and Mother Nature can throw us curveballs, and you just have to roll with it, you know. So we've had a very wet summer, a very wet year, you know. So just uh, so adapting to that, accommodating, you know, for that uh, as we grow our muscadines has been one challenge this year. With 600 acres of vines, as you would imagine, they produce tons of muscadines each year in which they sell to grocery stores, farmers markets, and even use them to produce their own muscadine wines. Muscadines are our first love. While we grow other fruits and have grown other fruits, muscadines are our first love. So we wanted to just do an outstanding job, or the best we could do, best job we could do making good muscadine wine, award-winning muscadine wine, um, and, to, and to showcase and highlight the creativity you know, in all the different ways you can make wine out of muscadine. So we have semi-dry muscadine wines and semi-sweet and sweet, and we have a port-style dessert wine. We have um, sangria-type flavored wines. It's a lot of fun, 17 different wines as of today. Over the last few years, they've made quite a name for themselves, so much so that they've become quite the popular agritourism spot for people to visit. We are open to the public six days a week, and we invite people out. They can come and pick their own muscadines seasonally. Uh, we also grow strawberries and blackberries. And so from February, really, through now, we'll have strawberries, then blackberries, then muscadines. And people can come out, pick those fruits, uh, buy things that are made out of those fruits, get them something to drink, uh, just and sit and gather and you know visit with friends while they're here. So it's been a lot of fun inviting the public out to our farm that's 15 miles from a two red light town and having them out and meeting the consumer, you know, and face to face. It's been a lot of fun. Reporting in Ray for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. Well, hey everybody, Ranger Nick. Coming up after the break, I'm road tripping to Jefferson, Georgia, and I'm gonna introduce you to an educator that's doing some really innovative teaching, and I'll show you what's inside of this state-of-the-art bus after this. USDA Pandemic Response and Safety Grant Program, Eligibility Requirements. Funding provided through USDA's Pandemic Response and Safety Grant Program is targeted to small specialty crop and aquaculture producers, food processors and distributors, 
and farmers markets. If you are a small business or a nonprofit and you work in one of the sectors we just named, then you may be eligible to apply for funds. To check your eligibility, visit usda-prs.grantsolutions.gov and click on the step one check eligibility green box. Here you will find several tables that detail the eligible industry NAICS codes and the small business size qualifications for each eligible industry. Industries included in the tables are eligible to apply for the first round of grant funds. The number of employees or annual receipts indicates the maximum allowed for a business and its affiliates to be considered eligible for funding. All applicants must be domestic entities owned, operated, and located within the 50 United States, the District of Columbia, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Guam, American Samoa, and the Commonwealth of the Northern Marina Islands. While USDA is limiting this first round of funding to small businesses, we may expand eligibility in future rounds of funding to include additional businesses. Future rounds are dependent upon availability of funds. USDA also may expand eligibility in future rounds of funding to include commodities not covered by the first round. If you have any questions, USDA has a team of experts ready to help. You can contact one of our technical assistance providers by phone at 301-238-5550 or by emailing usda.ams.prs at grantsolutions.gov. Our hours of operation are Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Time. I'm bored. There's nothing to do. School? I hate it. This pandemic has ruined everything. Words uttered by millions of America's youth, but never by our beloved kid at heart, Ranger Nick. No, nope, he loves school. So much so that he recently went to his attic, found that old dunce cap, and ventured into Jackson County for a unique perspective on a unique program that's helping kids stay engaged. Well, listen to that, will you? Man, that sound, you almost want to be in a hammock out in the woods enjoying that sound. Believe it or not, we're in Jefferson, Georgia, in a pretty urban area, and I'm getting a chance this month to hang out with Liz French. Hey, Liz, so good to be with you today. It's great to meet you, Nick. Thanks so much. Liz is a BioSteam coordinator, and that stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Art, and Math coordinator, Jefferson City Schools. Been doing this for about three years, and in these COVID times that we're in, I tell you what, the work that you're doing to get kids outside is incredible. Get them outside learning when they can't necessarily be safe inside. I'm gonna be the student today. I'm standing here with a net. We're standing out here in this stream, this wetland. Take me through what it would be like to be a student with you sampling this water. What do you think? All right, Nick, we're gonna have a great time today. So yes. one thing we're gonna do is sample our creek that runs from our wetlands down to the river for macroinvertebrates. Okay. So we'll be looking for different types of insects that you can find in the water and other uh, macroinvertebrates as well, such as snails or crawfish. Okay. Depending on what we find, we can actually tell the quality of the water. We can get a, a good idea of that water quality. So this is one type of sample that we can do to study the water here at the wetlands. Um, and we can do chemical sampling too, but this, this is a, a lot of fun. And I'm envisioning myself as a high school student, maybe not even knowing that this kind of a place exists. So what do we do down here to find these cool looking critters? That's right. So there's a, there's a little trick to finding them, but it's not too tough, I <laughs> okay. promise. What we'll do is use these excellent D-frame nets, which as you can see, you see the letter D, right? Ah, Easy enough to remember. Okay. We'll use these D-frame nets, we'll place them in the water. And then if you're ready to dance today, we're gonna do a little creek boogie. You'll stand in front of your net and do some shuffling, oh, do some I'm kicking around. We're gonna kick those rocks up and see if anything dislodges and then gets caught in your net. So we'll do this for uh, in, as long as you can stand it, I suppose, if you, <laughs> 10, 10 to 30 seconds, something okay. like that. And it's all getting churned up and it's all That's flowing right. into the net. I, I see, see some water moving around. Yeah, I, I don't see think some I, bubbles in there, nothing live in mind. I don't think I got anything in mine either. We did have a big yeah. rainstorm yesterday. Sometimes that affects our sampling. 
Well, we're going to meet up with Liz here in just a sec, but I want to introduce you to a teacher at Jefferson Middle School. This is Miss Jennifer McAuley. She's a life science teacher for seventh grade, and we're standing in an area right now that looks like a pretty established forest. But 16 years ago, back in 2005, this was what? Ms. Well, McCauley? it was just a cleared um, two acre lot that would be developed someday by the school. So I asked my um, principal at the time, Howard McGlennon, if we could please start an outdoor classroom and have nature trails and plant native trees and other plants. I have a nature center background and he said yes. Wow. So with a, a group of students that you know grows every year, we have an outdoor classroom club that helps maintain this. Uh, we started planting plants. The community was heavily involved, donating um, soil and, and trees and <laughs> Even the boulders were brought in by a parent who was at, sure. right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. at a construction company because, you know, we had plenty of space for a dump truck to come right through. Lowe's provided a grant for our pavilion. So we just, over these years, keep adding and maintaining and making an outdoor learning area. Well, and what's so cool about this is we're talking this month about in these COVID times, yes. being able to do things and teaching with innovation outside your students in the community has had ownership in this, in seeing this grow and adding to this. Do you get your students out here maybe before they go and hang out with Liz at the marsh and the creek as a pre-trip kind of thing? It's a great partnership between okay. our BioSteam wetlands and the outdoor classroom, thanks to, to Miss French. So yeah, students who have learned how to make observations in the outdoors and not being, you know, doing a worksheet in the classroom, sure and work with our classroom animals and things like that, they're so much better prepared to visit our wetlands. And you said something that was a beautiful segue. You said, speaking of classroom animals, so there's Liz and look at who Liz has. Y'all know that I'm an animal nut. I'm a nut in a lot of ways, but look at this lovely lady you said, Miss McCauley. This is a black rat snake. Look at this beauty. And this lady is in your classroom. Yes. Being used as an ambassador, as a teaching tool. That's and right. And we know all the wonderful things that snakes and reptiles do when being around students and thinking about enhancing learning. I tell you what, I want to show the folks one more thing. We're going to slither on over there next to look at the outreach efforts that Liz is involved with with this bio bus. Well, you know that old saying, the wheels on the bus go round and round. We've sure sung that to our kids a lot. And the wheels on this bus go round and round Jefferson City Schools with Liz. And Liz, we're on this bus right now. I gotta ask you though, we're passing by a little classroom area in the back. That's right. Beautiful flat screen. Mm -hmm. You are credited with building this, this classroom? Yes, with myself and one other teacher, we did most of the work on this bus. So pulling out all the seats, I'm the one under the bus scrambling to help hold the bolts while we're pulling the seats up through the floor. Yeah. Um, we laid the floor in here now is just the kind of uh, like the little floor planks that you just kind of stick down, yeah, right? And painted beautiful. the whole inside of the bus, put this furniture up and um, we did get some help mounting the TV in the back. but. That's pretty much it. And I drive the bus to our different schools. Good for, look at this. And I will admit, we watched you drive earlier. She's a wonderful driver with this bus, under pressure too. That was great. And we've got an area in here for students to come right. at the school, outside, in here to engage with some of these things. Even during these times, we're still able to engage with students and do innovative teaching. And they're getting a chance to interact with some of these, I mean, look at these turtle shells and buck skull and bird's nest and all these things they would interact with these and then go somewhere like we saw at the marsh? That's right, and actually most of these things on the table here are from the wetlands, or we use them in some sort of lesson when we're talking about um, different wetland animals or plants, wildlife, or um, just features of living things that they might learn about as they go to the wetlands. Wow, and the innovation, the games with the snakes, yeah. the owl mask. I need to find the kid that made this. This is great stuff. Right. This is the kind of innovation we're talking about. Even during these times, there are great teachers doing wonderful things with kids and they're making memories about ag and natural resources. Liz, thanks so much for today. Yeah. This is such a wonderful time together to see all that we saw. Well, y'all know what to do. You go online and check out things about the bio bus and other innovative teaching that's going on in Georgia and beyond. And while you're on there, check out the Ranger Nick Facebook page, see what I got going on. Until next time, like we always say for the Farm Monitor, I'm Ranger Nick, reminding you that enthusiasm is contagious. So pass it on. Y'all, thanks so much for watching. We look forward to seeing you right back here this time next month. See ya.
Up next, now that those leaves are starting to collect, information you need to know on complying with Georgia's new outdoor burn laws. Stay tuned. For a long, long time, Georgians have been getting rid of outdoor yard debris by burning it. Most times, all goes well, but sometimes it doesn't. Escape debris burning is the number one cause of wildfire in Georgia. Georgia Forestry Commission wildland firefighters respond to more than 3,500 wildfires a year. To serve you better, some changes are being made to the outdoor burning laws. As of July 2021, you no longer need to notify the Georgia Forestry Commission with your intention to burn hand-piled yard debris. The requirement to log in to gatrees.org or to call the toll-free notification number has been eliminated. New requirements added to the law put you in full charge of your burn and require that you follow five practices to legally burn yard debris. We're here to help you do that safely with an easy to remember formula. Before you start your fire, Take five. Take five means remembering five responsibilities you have and must legally take every time you burn hand pile debris. First point, measure the space between your burn pile and existing brush or woodlands. It must be 25 feet or more. That's about the width of a typical two lane highway. Space is also the second point on the star. Your fire must be at least 50 feet from any structure barns, sheds, garages, and the like. T is for time. Your burn can only take place between sunup and sundown. The star's fourth point is A, for attendance. The person responsible for the fire must stay on site until the fire is extinguished. Finishing up the Take 5 star, number five is R, for reasonable precautions. Take those precautions before you burn to prepare for any potential problems. Reasonable precautions include a pressurized water source, man-made or natural fire barriers such as bare mineral soil or bricks, hand tools such as shovels or fire containing equipment, and finally, weather awareness. You can easily check weather conditions and forecast on your computer or handheld device. Make sure you sign up for weather alerts. So what has changed? You no longer need to notify the GFC when you burn hand pile yard debris on your property. What hasn't changed is what you can and can't burn. Be sure to remember these rules you see on the screen. No garbage, only vegetative debris. Don't move the debris from one location to another to be burned. And follow all local laws. Requirements have not changed for agriculture, civiculture, and land clearing burns, nor for air curtain destructors. Call your local ranger for those activities. Suppression charges may apply if reasonable precautions are not taken and wildfire results. So don't ever be shy about calling 911 for help. Please visit our website for more information at gatrees.org. And thanks for helping keep Georgia safe from wildfire. Good information there and a huge thanks to the Georgia Forestry Commission for supplying us with all that. And as always, thank you for making the show possible. Take care, stay safe, and we'll see you next time right here on the Farm Monitor. Have a great week, everybody.